Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to our continued coverage of the FIDE World Cup 2021. Now, yesterday I didn't upload anything. Yesterday was the second classical game of chess uh, in the second round of the World Cup. And today there was a potential tie breaks. And the tie breaks are two 25 minute games, two 10 minute games, two five minute games, if necessary, all those games, and then an Armageddon game ultimately to decide. Now, timestamps are on the video player. We're going to go through a lot of stuff, going to look at some fun clips. Um, and yeah, y'all know how this works. So, um, the other thing that I want to say is I also got a carpet and maybe that helps with the echo. Maybe not. Maybe not. You let me know. All right. We're going to kick things off in the second game of classical chess between Magnus Carlsen and Sasha Martinovic from Croatia. Now, I actually don't care about much of this game at all. Uh, in fact, we can jump ahead to this end game. Uh, Magnus Carlsen uh, is trying to beat his opponent King Knight and three pawns versus King Bishop and three pawns. Uh, and the reason he's trying to do that is because uh, rating. If he draws this game, he knocks out Sasha, but winning is better than drawing for rating. And he still has winning chances. He has winning chances because he has a pawn majority, which is very important. And black has a weak pawn in the center. Now, Magnus plays b4. You might ask, why doesn't Magnus take on e5? Because after bishop f6, he loses the c3 pawn. So b4, bishop d6, c4, slowly making progress. Martinovic is vibing. But the problem is he vibes in the wrong direction. Apparently, he should have volunteered the b7 pawn for capture, gotten to this point, and after knight to c5, this move comes in handy because if takes, then king c5. And it's a draw. It's a draw because even though black will even win an extra pawn, this king will get to the corner, you cannot promote. But even the way he played it, uh, Magnus got some practical winning chances. Actually, a very nice idea here, b5. Um, he has practical winning chances, but uh, it's a draw. Position is a draw. Just don't take the pawn, because if you take the pawn, which he did, um, Carlsen gets to play c6, and if you take this pawn, then this pawn is not stoppable. You, you can't do anything about it. Um, so just don't take, okay, you took one pawn, so now it's plus six for white. White is completely winning. But now don't take the other pawn. King d6, okay, great. He doesn't take the other pawn, c takes b7. Uh, the position is officially something like made in 20. White is completely winning. King to c7, you need to prevent the king from taking your pawn by playing the move a6. Now, white is threatening a couple of things. Namely, white is threatening to win both the pawns and just win the endgame. But white also has some little tricks. You can give checks to deflect the king away. Or knight c5, knight b7, enabling promotion. And if king takes, then queen. So bishop comes back to f8. Knight takes e5. Very normal. Now the threat, the, the winning threat on the spot is knight c6 or knight d7. So black plays the move bishop d6, completely preventing knight d7 because after king takes, oh wait a minute, then you have a7. So Magnus plays it. Now the position is a draw again. Congratulations, Magnus Carlsen. You have thrown away mate in 15 to 0, 0, 0. Now, granted, the position is a little bit tricky. The best move apparently for white to win the game was king d5 because this is something called tsukswang and now black has no moves. Um, if bishop e5, king e5, this does nothing, you stop this pawn, the king cannot come up because you queen, game is over. And black has no other moves. Black plays this, knight c6, resigns. Resigns because you would actually think it's this, but it's, it, it's not this, it's this. Because this pawn cannot be stopped. Okay, great. Wonderful. We have a draw again because of king c6. And now you cannot push this pawn because takes, and if you come back to e5 with check, I go here, I win both pawns, congrats. So Magnus Carlsen is like, ah, damn, king d4. And black has a decision. Where do you move this bishop? You need to, do you need, where do you keep this bishop on which diagonal? Where are you going? Okay, bishop c7 is good. Very good. King d3, bishop d6, very good. It's a draw. Nice. King f5. Okay, that's wonderful. Let's just obviously shuffle back and forth, which is what we've been doing the entire game. And, uh... Yeah, Sasha Martinovic moves his bishop away from the promotion square, allowing Magnus to cut the circulation. And if bishop e5, king e5, obviously the pawn promotes. And if king c7, king e4, and the game is over because when you push, you now have re-enabled this. You've re-enabled this and king c6 no longer works as a defense because you can just freely move the king. And uh, the difference was that the king was able to walk over and take this pawn, which it's not able to do now. Uh, and Magnus Carlsen went on to bring his king, win the second pawn, and very easily win this game. The players uh, took turns throwing here back and forth, but Magnus got there in the end, the quick 2-0 knockout. And he actually moves on to play Ariantari, but more on that later. This is all I wanted to show from this game because 
it was mildly adventurous. Now, second game that I have for you is the game between Mikhail Krasenkov and Kirill Alexenko. Now, the reason I'm showing you this game, uh, Mikhail is from uh, uh, Poland and Alexenko is from Russia. He's 22 years old, 23 years old. He just played in the candidates uh, as the wild card. Krasenkov is 58, which in chess terms means you're in the grave, uh, for the most part, unless you're Vichy Anand or uh, who played for a very long time. Was it Karchnoi? Karchnoi played for a super long time. And this is their second game of classical chess. And it begins with uh, a Catalan. I mean, of course, it's, I mean, two Soviet Union, well, I shouldn't say that about Poland because Poland doesn't want to be associated with Soviet Union. Let's put it this way. Uh, attempted a permanent annexation of Soviet Union country Poland, which is a totally standalone country, and I got mad love for Poland. Um, there's also this Polish streamer, um, uh, uh, Bartosz, and, uh, well, Soviet Union, Kirill Alexienko, who literally looks like Ivan Drago. Uh, and, of course, we're going to get, like, super solid positional chess. So we have this... Uh, you know, uh, Catalan style, knight d7, queen c2, c6. The players play, you know, normally nowadays players play h4 and h5. Well, these are, these are you know, Eastern Europeans. So we have a5, a4, fighting and jostling for positioning on the queen side. Very nice little Tetris piece of action here. Uh, black plays the move rook to e8. White plays knight to a3, not because he wants to play knight b5, but because if he had played knight to c3, he would have disconnected the queen from the defense of the c4 pawn. Bishop d6, and here, bishop f4. Yes, you would be doubling your structure, but you would be getting some very nice control of the center, which is the only place that black can break out. For that reason, black plays the move e5, a liberating move. We have pawn takes, we have knight takes, we have bishop takes, we have bishop takes, we have pawn takes, we have knight takes, we have knight takes, we have rook takes. All right, the center has completely cleared out. Where is the imbalance in the pawns? They have both light squared bishops, but here I have three. Here I have four. So white has a central advantage. Black has what we call a queenside majority. That usually helps in the end game because if you trade everything off, the pawn will remain. However, in a position with a lot of pieces on the board, if you cannot move the majority, the majority is a sitting duck. Does that make sense? If the three pawns can't move, they're just going to be hunted down. So Krasen Cow plays knight c4, obviously. Rook goes back. And black's knight ends up on b4. That is a beautiful square for the knight. That is, it's just a fantastic square. Queen moves up. By the way, yes, 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 but they don't, th that's not good, right? So both queens get out of danger. And here Krasenko plays a knight, he plays a classy move. Knight to d6, rook, d rook e7, and e5. He has given black the d5 square, but he's traded a permanent lockdown on d6. That knight exerts pressure on everything. And in a perfect world, after playing e5, you will also play a, that's not, no this if you can and if you need to um of course it does come with the drawback of you weakening your king but it comes with the positive of attacking your opponent like a madman queen b6 okay well now you literally cannot play this move so you play rook to d2 funny that if you plug this into a computer it tells you to play h4 but krasenka is a classy 58 year old grandmaster who has seen it all in terms of chess he's not going to play this nonsense with h4 he's going to focus on the center of the board black plays rook d7 rook d1 rook d8 I mean, essentially what we have here is a fight on the D-file. The computer says 0, 0, 0, go home, shake hands, go play the tie breaks. No. H6 by black, rook to H4. Just in case you are wondering, maybe in the future I will sacrifice over here, but black plays the move F6, calling the bluff on the entire white position because you cannot play F4. Like, if you could play F4, for example, I, I mean, just just like this. Like, we have a game. I mean, I'm going to maintain my, my, my... But you don't have that. And now, after the move rook to h4, lining up seemingly some sort of potential sacrifice, which looks completely impossible, we have rook takes h6. Combining positional play with dynamics. The grandmaster strikes with rook takes h6, gh6, queen h6. Wait a minute. One guy just gave up a full rook. Excuse me? Now, if you take on e5, then white just takes the bishop. So now I've gotten back a bishop, then I will take the pawn. My knight survives, white is completely winning. It literally goes from 0, 0, 0 to plus 15. Well, in Magnus's case, that doesn't matter. Um, but of course, that doesn't happen. But you know that the amazing thing is, somehow this central block disconnects the queen and the knight completely from that side of the board. It just shows you the power of the pieces, the relative value of the pieces as the game is being played. It doesn't matter that the rook sacrifices down five points, right? So queen c7, queen f6, and we have bishop e6 check, giving up the bishop, 
And it looks like we might have a draw, but one final attempt at mobilizing the final piece, and Alexeyenko plays this, and that is the wrong move. He needed to cover his king, because after queen e6 check, it's not rook g4 which is gonna kill you, because then rook g7, it's this check, forcing you to either put something in front of your king or move it, and now the beautiful move, which he missed, it has nothing to do with the check, it has to do with this, knight, e8, triple exclamation point, queen d8, queen h6. By the way, you cannot sacrifice because then you would lose the last line of your defense and then you would actually lose the game. And Mikhail Krasenkow brings the knight back, swarms the king down a full rook. Alexeyenko resigned because after rook takes knight, there is check here. Queen h5. You can block with both rooks, but they are sitting ducks. I already used that. Sacrificial lambs. There you go. And uh, resigns. And Krasenkow knocks out Alexienko in the classical portion of their match to move on to the second round. The third round, I apologize, of the World Cup 2021. Now, we've got a lot of games to look at, so I'm going to try to speed things up here. Monika Soczko, also from Poland, versus Pia Kramling, who has played in like six or seven different Olympiads. By the way, the opening might look a little bit familiar. This actually resembles the last game quite, quite similarly. I believe this is the rapid portion of their match. Uh, they drew the first two games of the Classical. Uh, we have a very close structure. In fact, as the players were developing their pieces and getting everything all set up and ready to go, Black played the move a5 because when this bishop departs, you want the b4 square, as we saw in the last game. And uh, that's exactly what we see. Another knight attempting to come to b4. Rook c1, rook c8, a trade, and queen f5. Queen f5 is a, is a very common... Something to f5 is very common in these positions. Um, here there's also this move bishop h3, which just is a direct attack on the rook and usually forces it to move. But queen f5, kind of like, you want black to play g6. And you're going to see in a few moves that black actually does, in fact, play g6. And the queen goes all the way back. And essentially, you argue that black has weakened the structure. And essentially, you would argue correctly. This is an isolated pawn position. This is an extremely powerful bishop. So white is better from the positional standpoint. So what does black do? Cre start creating different imbalances, right? We have two in the center, split pawns, maybe active rook. Maybe you try to m bring these pawns down the board. What does white have? Knights who have three. And a few moves later, this very funny queen a1. Now, this, this queen a1 is very common, ju just so you all know. Like the queen standing with the bishop after the rooks come to the middle, very common in these structures. I look like a former president. Uh, knight f3, knight e4, bishop d4, bishop c5. Black is worse from a positional standpoint, but better from the dynamic standpoint. The open files, the ability to fight for different complexes of squares due to the pawn structure in the center. Queen b2, and we kind of have a fate, like a, like, a, like a tense standoff, like no one can make progress. So what does black do? Bishop a6. The one piece that's not doing anything, let's activate it. What does white do? Trade in the center, continuing to create imbalance. Now I have a completely isolated pawn, but I have more pawns in the center. Rook e1, and I'm going to use that weakness. Bip. Very common. And very often, very, very often, the best move is to take and call the bluff, but you double isolate your pawns, you give black a pass pawn, there's gonna be positions where you trade the bishop and play c4, and like, this is so annoying to deal with, right? So, many people don't take, and what ends up happening with that pawn is it gets traded off. Now, we do have some jostling in the center here, black uses the central majority very nicely, and white decides to take. Creating a knight versus bishop endgame, where black has a really ugly pawn structure. But oftentimes when you have an ugly pawn structure, it means that you have open lines all over the board. So, rook to d1, let's move our queen out of the way. Now c4. And I'm using my a and c pawns to break apart your beautiful little structure over there. e3, takes, takes, takes. Takes, takes. Takes. Wait, when the dust settled, black still has a b pawn. Wait a minute, whoa, 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 whoa. How did that happen? How did that happen? Hold on a second. C4, why did white not do something about it? Because there's nothing, there's nothing white can do because of this. You see, that's the thing. White, black is probably strategically like, like on the verge of throwing up. No, pro listen, Pia Kramling's very classy, probably not. If I, was in, if I was playing with black here, I'd be like, dude, my position, like, uh, sorry, with, um, if I was playing with black, yeah, strategically. But dynamically, it doesn't matter that you have all these pawn islands because all your lines open up for the rook, for the queen, for the other rook, for the bishop, bam, 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 bam. 
And when the dust settles, because white needs to deal with the threats, white maintains one very nice boat of pawns, but one pawn for black makes the difference. And that's it. Black just ultimately ends up opening the line anyway toward the king. But the deciding factor in this game is, of course, the b-pawn. And it was in this position that Monica Sochko resigned. This was the one decisive game in their match. She resigned because queen b2 leads to a multitude of mates. Uh, and uh, queen e4 leads to the b-pawn promoting. So a very nice victory for Pia Kramling. And she moves on to the third round. Um, another uh, hero... Shout out to Alan Pichot versus Ivan Sharic. These are the number one players in their country, Argentina. Pichot is number one in Argentina, right? He is. Argentina Fide. Argentina Fide. It's Pichot by one rating point over Sandro Mareco, who, whose result we will uh, take a look at later. No spoilers. Um, now... This is their second game of classical chess. Peachot has been playing in these online events. You know, iron sharpens iron and all that. We have a knight orf. Alfil Hethinko. That's like Spanish, Spanish. I can, I can also do it in Argentinian Spanish. Knight d7, queen e2, e6, f4, and let's go. Let's go. A little long castle action, little shoulder roll dancing. B5, a3. This is like, this is vintage Sicilian stuff. Black is like, bro, you castle in long? I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna destroy you on the C file. White's like no 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 no. Your king's in the center of the board. Have you even learned basic opening principles? Like what are you what are you doing over there? And Black's like I don't need a castle. G5. And if you take knight H7 and now you can't move anything over here, this obviously looks pretty good for White. So what does White do? Let's back up. Come and take my pawn. Okay. H4. <laughs> Listen, it's your fault. Oh, I made my ear ring. I clapped so loud. Now, look, it's your fault you're not castling, because by the time I shred this position open, something is going to arrive. Now, folks, in the Sicilian defense, when there is a king stuck in the middle of the board, you either have a rook or a queen here, there is something known as the knight sacrifice of the Sicilian defense. You know what I'm talking about? The advanced players will know what I'm talking about. It's when you put a knight on d5 or f5. Caballo de cinco, caballo f5, you sacrifice the knight and you open up the center of the board and the king is devastated. Now, keep an eye on that because it may or may not happen. Look at this. This is bad news. Sharij must have thought that his king was safe and that he was taking, he's gonna trade some pieces. And to his credit, um, yeah, I mean, if th this is a problem because pieces are about to start getting knight f5. And here's the thing. If you try to call my bluff and take my bishop, what the hell are you doing? Your rook's hanging. Now, if you take the knight, if you take the knight, well, what's the justification? I take on f5. Of course, I have to open up my queen, and now our bishops see each other. You, you go knight e5. Now, if you had taken on g2, trying to just remove pieces from my army, I would have taken, and your rook would have been hanging. And then let's say you would have gone rook to b8, right? You think, okay, dust has settled. What dust has settled and where? Because knight d5, rook e1, and black can basically resign. Okay, so knight e5. Now I take, and now I take. I've just traded a bishop for a knight and a bishop for a bishop. Certainly I'm out of material. No, 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 no. Because a rook is hanging. You play f6, that's fine, queen e3. This is something my former and now current coach, because I will be playing chess tournaments more actively, Wojciech Miranda used to call a time stop. And he still calls it a time stop. It is when one side is attacking, one side is defending, but the attacking side plays a move and time kind of pauses and there is just nothing that can be done. White has a plan, this and this, and black is lost. And maybe this and maybe this, like black can't do anything. Black moves the king out of the way, we go here. Black plays a rook move to make sure that the king can run away and guard this. Okay, knight d5. It's like just announcing to the opponent that you are going to take their soul and there's nothing they can do about it. They have an amount of time that they can still stay alive. Okay, bishop back to d8. Okay, g5. Like I said, I mean, it's just, you're just gonna play your plan. Good luck, right? Pawn takes g5. Okay, f6. It's everything Gotham said in this video. And by the way, queen e8 check is about to arrive, if you're not careful. And um, takes rook f1. And just keep gorging yourself with pawns. Keep going. King g7 takes. The bishop has been won back. Remember last game, 98. Oppa. Opa, 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 knight to e8, king g8, queen takes g5, and Sharic resigned because if he goes here, 
there is the absolutely devastating removal of the defender. And um, you can win back your knight. And for a moment, you can have completely equal material. And then I will play check here, check here, and take your queen, and you'll look and go, damn. You'll go, da, my queen. And somewhere Eric Rosen will like twitch because he won't know what happened. Alan Pichot uh, from Argentina defeats Ivan Sharic, knocks him out of the World Cup, and uh, Pichot is rolling. And I know we have a lot of Argentinian fans. You guys always are like, yo, feature a Pichot game, talk to him on stream. I will. I, have, I actually have plans to do that. I don't know if he knows that. I don't know if he would want to. I'm not the highest rated player in the world. I know Grandmasters only talk to other Grandmasters. It's like a rule. It's a contract you sign before they give you the title. Um, well, I have collabed with Hikaru quite a lot, so that probably doesn't make any sense. But, and Anish. Congratulations to Alan Pichot. He moves on to round number three. Now, Sanan Shugirov from Russia. Super strong player. This guy, every time I have to play Sanan Shugirov in Blitz on chess.com, I want to cry. And every time I play Nihal Saran, I want to cry. Now, by the way, it's kind of funny that Nihal's name is written forward and everyone's name is written backward. Anyway, Nihal Saran like, hasn't lost a classical chess game in the last two years because he didn't play last year. And this year, he went to these two Serbian tournaments, absolutely destroyed everybody, qualified to the second round. This is the second classical game in their match. Um, and uh, it's E4, E5. It's Rui Lopez, blah, 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 blah. And um, White plays something known as the anti martial because here the main line is C3, H3, and Black chooses whether or not to play D5. Normally, if Black is going to play D6, Black will play D6, but Black clearly is not playing D6. Probably Nihal Saran wanted to play D5. Um, this move makes Black make a decision. Black really can't play the Marshal against this, so Black will be forced to play D6, but it is a commitment for White to play the move A4. Knight D2, Knight D7. Aha, uh -huh. Knight D7, wow. Okay, so Black probably has two plans. Number one, Black wants to play Knight C5 or Knight B6 and do something over there. Number two, Black probably wants to play F5. To play F5, Black will probably play the move King to H8. You ready? Okay, uh-huh, taking on a4, of course, that was part of the plan. And if you want to take back like this, uh, then I will get the bishop pair. I have the two bishops. Uh-huh, bishop c8. And bishop c8 could go this way or go to e6. Uh-huh, mm-hmm. Okay, okay, very nice. Yes, all of the things. Look at that. And by the way, he, he didn't play king h8 because there is no more bishop. And he plays this because when the rook opens, now this bishop fights for these squares and could put some pressure on the white position. Very dynamic position. Black has the bishop pair, but a weak A pawn. White has better control of the center, particularly the d5 square. Let's see what happens. b4, great. Queen e8, knight d2, bishop h4. Nihal is bringing the forces over here. You know, he picked up, picked up the good stuff from the store. He's showing up to the party with the good stuff. Rook e2, and now here comes the horsey. The horsey wasn't participating, right? Knight f1, knight g6. Every piece is about to get involved. Knight g3, knight f4. And it was probably around this point that Shugirov was like, yo, am I really just going to cold-bloodedly go for this pawn on the queen side while Nihal is like setting up to invade my house? Like you can see the home invading about to occur. You see Nihal on your roof. You see him. He's in a mask. He's like ready. He's ready. He's, he's telling you he's going to do it. Kind of like the last game. All right. He plays rook b8, knight f5. Shugirov couldn't really decide, by the way, he technically offered a repetition of moves here. He couldn't decide whether he was attacking or whether he was defending, and he went back. And I'm assuming in going back, he was like, maybe Nihal will go here, I don't know, maybe he'll go back to h4 and we'll have a draw, I don't know. But Nihal probably had a moment here like, okay, clearly I'm being offered a repetition of moves, but I'm Nihal Sarin. So queen g6, I'm playing this for a win, actually. Right, I'm playing this for a win. H5, H4, whoa, 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 whoa. What are we doing here? Knight F, okay. I mean, H4, H3. Now, white has to go here. Uh, if white takes on H3, this is absolutely devastating. Don't do this to yourself. So G3, Knight E6, and Queen H7. I know why you play Queen H7, because you think that maybe in the future you can even launch the G pawn at your opponent, and your queen's not a target anymore. Bishop B7, the bishop that you thought would go this way is potentially going to open up on this diagonal, Oh, here we go. Knight takes e5. And let's not forget that the players are also low on time because it's move 33, 34. De4, fe4, bishop b4, knight d7, takes, 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 takes. And when the dust settles, 
one man is attacking his opponent. And it's definitely not the guy whose name is Sh Sanan Shugirov. King to e1, there is a big decision to play. Where do you move your king? Okay, do you play king g1? Do you play king e1, king e3? Do you play bishop f4? So bishop f4, um, if knight f4, then of course queen takes d8 check. There would have been this move, bishop d5. And now the bishop is completely disconnected. If you play this looking for something over there, black gets to the king first. Um, he plays king e1. King g1 was the best move. Because then your rook can come back and defend everything. And after king e1, bishop d3 is a serious problem because queen f1 is threatened. And so is queen e4. And so is knight g5, knight f3. And you just have nothing. Whereas in this position, there is no threat if you had played king g1. Like if, I don't know, knight g5 had been played to go here, you would have just taken the bishop. If bishop to f6, um, you can bring your rook back. I mean, it's still an absolutely terrifying position, but he went here and uh, yeah, Nihal swarmed him. He swarmed him with all the pieces. Bishop c4 back. King is completely... The king cannot run because this comes. Bishop f4. Takes, takes. Queen e4 check. And um, all Nihal needed was a queen and a bishop. And a dream. Because after queen to e2, very calmly looking for the simplification, Shugirov resigned. He resigned because if queen e2, bishop e2, he cannot prevent the pawn from promoting. Um, I mean, I suppose he can, but he would lose... He would lose his rook, and he would be dead lost. So, Nihal Sarin with the black pieces knocks out Russian very strong grandmaster Shugirov, uh, and uh, qualifies to round number three. Amazing stuff. Now, uh, this matchup: Ali Reza Firuja versus. I, I'm every time I see Sindarov's name, I always say Javohir. I would be I wouldn't be shocked if it's pronounced Yavohir, but I don't know. From Uzbekistan, uh, Uzbekistan also has. Um, the other grandmaster, older player, 26 years old, because Javo here is like 15, uh, whose name is like, I think it's Jakongir, but that's, that might be not 100% correct. He knocked out Lenier Dominguez, number 13 in the world, so he's already through. And um, yesterday, Sindarov was completely winning versus uh, Ali Reza, but Ali Reza held like a 100-move game. This was their 10-minute game, I believe. They drew both of their 25-minute games, so this is their fifth game, and we have a King's Indian defense, and Sindarov plays c5. Not the classical e5, he plays c5. Ali Reza chooses to lock the center like this, and they maneuver for a while. In fact, the center doesn't break. In fact, Sindarov completely logs down the center of the board, and the way the King's Indian is played is white attacks the king, the queen side, and black tries to attack the king side. That, that is just how this opening works. Knight h5 or knight to e8. F5, Rook B1. Like, who is going to attack who and how and why and where and when? Okay, Knight back to C3. Knight, Queen to E7, Bishop B2, F4. Nothing was traded for a long time until this. Ali Reza begins a trade of pieces on the Queen side with takes, takes, Knight F6. Now, it is very well known that if you trade the light squared bishops in the King's Indian defense, Black has very limited attacking chances. Which is probably why Ali Reza beeline for it. And here's why. The bishop is like the sniper. It just sees everything from a distance. White can often lock this structure without that light squared bishop present and focus on being over here. But black has kind of locked things up in the center, so it's not so simple for white to attack either. Rook bc1, queen d7. And there is a looming threat in this position that Ali Reza completely missed. This is under pressure, so he defends it. And here, Sindarov realizes that even though he doesn't have a light squared bishop, um, he has an attack. And here it is. F3. This is known as a clearance sacrifice for the F4 square. Knight takes, knight h5. Knight f4. Oh, <laughs> oh, we're cooking something up now in the kitchen. Ali Reza really didn't like this. Because if he stays around trying to guard b5, oops. It's mate or you lose the knight. That's not good. Queen d1, queen b5. And Ali Reza's like, wait a minute. What, what is happening? How, how, am I, how am I getting attacked on the queen side in a king's Indian defense? Let me try to create a little bit of counterplay by sacrificing this pawn. And while I'm at it, I'm going to sacrifice this pawn too. Wait, but there's no play. Sindarov, after bishop d2, kicks out the knight. They clash. Trade knights. Sindarov's just two pawns up. 
How is he going to convert or how is Ali Reza going to create enough counterplay? Well, Ali Reza is going for a little kingside action. Sindarov just shuts it all down, offers a trade of queens. Of course, we're not going to get a trade of queens. No fear, just bishop h4. If g takes h4, queen g4, and it's mate. I mean, it's literally mate. You cannot prevent checkmate. You have to give away everything and you still get mated. So bishop h4, now Sindarov's up three pawns. Ali Reza has to trade queens. Okay. And the rest of the game is easy. Easy peasy. Bring the king. Bring the king. Bring the rooks. At some point, you're going to push the pawns. And here we go. And the pawns are going. And there they go. And Ali Reza resigns. And he was not able to win again. And Yavokir Sindarov knocks out Ali Reza Firuja from the World Cup. Unbelievable stuff. By the way, I'm just going to say something right now. And really, this is like not going to be some crazy message because it's 31 minutes into a YouTube video that I made. I have seen so much hate being spouted about Ali Reza Firuja. And I understand that he's been involved in like, you know, the thing in the World Blitz Championship when um, he complained to the Arbiter and there was the Tata Steel thing. And he, you know, he slammed the table after some... I don't know where this has come from, but people are really, really vocally hating on Ali Reza. Like, to the point that they're like, ever since he transferred federations, he's no longer the same. I'm cheering for him to lose. I don't know. I don't know where this is coming from. I, anyway, I'm just going to say that. I mean, I, I wish him nothing but the best. I, I hope he gets the 2800. I hope he's a contender. He's a, he's a young guy who's been through a lot in life thus far, you know? Like, I, all these, the antics during the games, I, I couldn't care less about that stuff. I, anyway, that's just me. And that takes me to my final game and our final two matchups. Um, there was uh, this matchup, Chiparinov versus Rasmus Svane. And on the women's side, there was a matchup between Olya Badelka from Belarus, I believe, uh, and her opponent's Russian international master. I will tell you in a second her name. Uh, it is... Matnadze, which is actually a Georgian name, but Anna Matnadze lives in Spain. Both of them went to the Armageddon. They were 4-4, and the Armageddon decided who was going to uh, the, next, the, ne the next round. And for this one, I actually have a clip, but we will take a look at this game just a little bit longer. Um, it was... Uh, the way, by the way, just real quick, the way that Armageddon has decided, you literally flip a coin for who's white, for who's black the person who wins the coin toss chooses what color they play white gets four minutes black gets white gets five minutes black gets four minutes if the game is a draw black wins and on move 60 they gain two seconds every move which is by the way the dumbest thing ever because how do they even know it's move 60 is it even on the clock i don't even know it's like this tiny little number anyway um this the, the game truly is not the most fascinating thing in the world it was a scotch uh and uh it was a mainline scotch both pins were blocked. H4. This is going to look a little bit dumb. Don't worry. This is like theory or something. But by like the move, by like move 20, Chiparinov uncorked a really nasty move. He uncorked this move. Knight d6 check. We saw this in uh, Pichot's game, opening up the center like this. Um, by about move 30, it was very clear. In fact, right here, Rook sacrifice, then adding a layer of a pin here. It was very clear that one man was on pace to win this game in a plus 9.5 position, and that was Chiparina from Bulgaria. Um, but it's move 32. He has to make 28 more moves. And do you know how much time he had on his clock to make those 28 moves? I'm gonna tell you all right now, okay? Right here, they shuffled it right here. Chiparina has to make 23 moves in 23 seconds to get the extra time and not lose on time. Okay? Let's take a look at this clip. This is how both of these Armageddons ended. This was so funny. Uh, it, it, it's really not worth the chess. It's, it, let's just clear the board so there's no distractions. This is how the Armageddons ended. Five, 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 Chipperina playing fast, can be seven, he's surviving. 20 yeah. seconds left for Chipperina, he takes the pawn. Will he make it? <laughs> A6, he pushes the pawn. No, that she pushes the pawn. We have both boards up. It's going to get Badelka's really good. completely winning. Badelka's going to win. Will Chaparinov make it? We are about to have an old-fashioned scramble. 12. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my goodness. 40 seconds away from the increment. He's got 10 seconds. 
This is unbelievable. He's pushing his fonts. Check by Spain, Bishop G1. Do you know what move number it is? Or you have no idea. <laughs> it, 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 I do. It's move, it's move 50 or so. Oh, well, my that, God. That, oh, my wow. God. He's, got, he's just got to move. He's got to move. He, he shouldn't promote. He should move. Takes D2. Takes D2, queen. It's, it's insane. What's going on? Wow. Will Lord make into it? I think he's made into it. He's got the increment. I can see it. He's got the increment. He's got, yeah, he got the increment. Oh, wow. Look at the other board. Look at Fidel. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Look at this board. Every piece is knocked over. This board, they actually made it to move 60. So he got the bonus time, so his opponent resigned. This board is a, is a catastrophe. Cat zero seconds. She lost on time. Matnadze lost on time on, right before move 60 with all the pieces knocked over. You are not allowed to make a move in chess and hit the clock when a piece is knocked over. That is a violation, and that probably happened about 20 times. So that is how the round ended with some pieces knocked over. Um, and of course, as always, we will uh, end our day by taking a look at uh, at the way this looks. So, Carl Centauri in the round of 32, Vojtashek Matlakov, Malakov, not to be confused with Matlakov, Maxim and Vladimir, Daniil, yeah, of course, Andrei, yeah, a bunch of Russians, versus Nijat Abasov from uh, Azerbaijan. Here he is, Jakongir Vahidov, who knocked out uh, another Russian player. Basem Amin from Egypt. I'm gonna feature him. I know the Egyptians love to love to have their man featured um, versus Etienne Bakro. Um, and yeah, you are all more than welcome to obviously take a scroll. And we are in the uh, we are in the almost in the quarterfinals. Badelka moves on to against Garachkina. Every one of these matchups has a Russian speaking player, I swear. Literally every single every single matchup. Every single matchup has a Russian speaking player. This is crazy. Heidi Kadronavali from India has moved on. You know, you know who I, what matchup I really hate? And I know the Indians are going to hate this too. I hate this matchup. Why do they got to put two Indians against each other? Why can't Vidit and Adiban just go and win their own matches? Terrible. Ah, anyway, that concludes the third round, folks. Uh, and uh, oh, Sorry, the second round. And I will see you all tomorrow for round number three. Very long recap already. Peace out. Uh, get out of here.